having us. Right, so I should probably start by saying my internet connection has been stable for the last three weeks straight, and it has decided to be unstable on us tonight for the first time. So hopefully this holds us. I hope you guys can hear me. When you can't, um, I think the best way to let me know that you can't hear me is uh, someone WhatsApp me and let me know that um, I've been talking to myself. Right. Um, sadly for everyone, I have the presentation, so I'm going to have to um, hope that this holds for all of us. Let me know when you guys can see my screen, if you can. Yes, we can see now. Excellent. Brilliant. So I'll, I'll make this full screen and um, hope that it doesn't completely uh, take, take our focus. I don't know how much you have or haven't said, meanwhile, Fionn, so if I do repeat things, I apologize. We have, we have not started. We were just having a chat. Excellent. I'll just take our faces off the screen and so on. So what we are hoping to talk about today is, um, as Enrique has well prefaced it, psychological safety, but it also psychological safety in the context of what we're living through today, which we call an extreme focal-led environment or a crisis-led environment. So if we're going to go straight into um, introductions, I suppose, first things first, I won't uh, run you through all of these numbers. Um, they're a bit cringeworthy, some of them. But what I will say, because I think it's important, is that my main focus, irrespective of all these numbers, is psychological safety. Um, both Fiona and I live and breathe this. People in the, in the larger People Not Tech team, um, this is all we focus on. So um, ideally, we have a bunch of things to tell you today that you haven't heard of before. Um, Fionn, have you had a chance to ask people to have a, a thought about the question we had for them? No, we haven't started any of our content, so you're, you are good to go. Cool. So what we were hoping to do, because uh, this is a, 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 um, a hybrid format, if you wish. Um, on the one hand, we have the chat on our phones, or we used to while my internet was working, but Fionn probably um, is a lot more stable than I am, so she can still read what you answer. Um, and on the other hand, this is taking my entire screen, so obviously I can't see everything at the same time. But what we were hoping to find out from you guys today, um, during the course of what we have to say, is one, have you had um, an idea of the concept of psychological safety before? Was that something that was playing out in your organization or in your mind? Um, and also, if so, and you knew about it and you were aware of it, you were potentially measuring it, you were potentially looking into ways to increase it, what were those things that you were doing? So was there an idea of psychological safety? And if so, what were you doing about it? Those are the things we're hoping for you to tell us. And we're going to have a couple of other questions as we go along. So skipping over this uh, presentation, I'll let Fionn say hello, although she has done. Yeah, just a brief hello from me. We want to focus on the content more than ourselves, but it's important that you know who we are. Um, so my focus is entirely on teams. Spent years working on leadership. Um, worked out that teams was the, was the key and was what I was really hugely passionate about. And psychological safety um, is so much at the forefront of teams that um, it was only natural that Dwayne and I would end up working together and obsessing together about psychological safety. I like that. that that's what we do. We, we obsess together. Um, so going straight into what we want to talk to you about, first and foremost, we want to be very transparent about the fact that we make software and um, our only framework to talk to you about what we found over the last nearly two years is through the prism of the software. Um, thankfully, this, what the software does is precisely that, measures and increases psychological safety. And so in the, in the journey we have taken to build this and to bring it to, um, to our clients and to our partners, we have learned a number of things. And the only way to tell you the story is um, if we go a little bit through that. I know that that sounds promotional. In this time and age, nobody has any time and interest in that. We're not trying to sell you software. In fact, what we are doing for COVID, we'll tell you later, is give away our software. But we do have to use it as a frame of reference so that we show you um, what the point is. So what it does is essentially makes teams more productive. It's a work tool through which people can answer questions and then create a dialogue with their team leader. 
the type of dialogue that remains within a team bubble, that's really important to us. Um, and also really, really important is the fact that we then find ways to reward people for speaking up and for uh, changing the behavior from being closed off to being um, open and vulnerable. And then, you know, we try to make it fun and engaging because uh, God knows everything else um, we work with is not. We um, spend a lot of time trying to figure out how this best fits into the lives of uh, teams that were already remote before this crisis hit, meaning agile teams and their ceremonies and meetings. Um, and then we have um, concentrated most of our efforts on finding ways to increase emotional intelligence. We'll tell you a little bit more about that afterwards. So essentially it helps teams keep a finger on the pulse of the team from the point of view of psychological safety. And it is vital for remote and distributed um, teams. I can't really tell if these um, bits and pieces from the uh, Zoom are covering my screen or not. I'm gonna hope they aren't. So good luck to you guys. If you can't read something, just ask us. But um, going back to the beginning of why we're doing this and what we've learned, we're trying to frame with you today two very big topics. One, what is psychological safety in times of peace, if you will, in, under normal circumstances, when our focus is that of increasing performance of various teams. And then we're trying to um, bring that into today's situation and today's environment of, if you wish, sudden digital and, and um, transformation that has been overnight for everyone. So those are the two big topics that we are framing together. But to do that, we have to go back um, to the basics. So let's start, Fionn, maybe with a definition of what psychological safety is. Yeah, so we've got a, a kind of timeline, if you like, of definitions here, just to bring us right, just to reset us for a moment and think about how, what, what is psychological safety? So the first definition we've got there is Khan 1990s. This is the first time that we saw psychological safety being defined. Um, he defines it as being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of self-image, status, or career. So that was a pretty powerful start. Um, and then next, and we'll talk about this in the next um, section as well, but this is from Dr. Amy Edmondson. Um, and this is a, one of the most widely used definitions now of psychological safety. And that is psychological safety is a shared belief, oh, my slides have gone. I think it's on my phone. Is a shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Have we lost Duena? Okay. Right. Yes, we, we lost her. Yes. Uh, I don't, I, right. I, can, I cannot see her. Right, yeah. okay. okay. All right. What we'll do is I'll carry on. Oh, she's back. The next definition is one that we had put together ourselves, um, but I do kind of need to be able to see it on the screen to remember it because it's a fairly lengthy one. Hey, could you put the slides back up for me? I thought we had them, but let's try again. I was um, wondering why you guys are so quiet. Many apologies, guys. What happens at a time like this? Going to move on to talking about team and family, but the slides... Yeah, your your really connection had easy. dropped, uh, Duena, for a second, but now you're back. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So the third one, so you've got the, the Dr. Amy Edmondson definition, which is that psychological safety is a shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. And then we've got one that we put together just from our experience, our experience of working closely with people on psychological safety. So that is that a psychologically safe team is one that feels like family and can move mountains together. Think back to the last time you made some magic with the team, how you were open. Can you go back a sec? Hmm? Go back one. How you were open and debated <laughs> and were vulnerable and learning, creating and getting the stuff done. That well-oiled machine that felt fun to be a part of, that is what psychological safety actually feels like. So moving away from, moving on one step from the academic definition to how it actually feels. So on that note, let's go on to the next slide. And this is one of the key phrases that we've um, come up with that really resonates with people. So team equals family. And this is a concept that some people are really super comfortable with and some people are less comfortable with because it feels very emotional. Um, but what's actually been seen 
through a lot of the research that's been done with the top performing teams and be specifically looking at some work by Daniel Coyle and the book he wrote, uh, The Culture Code, is that one of the words, some of the language that continually comes up when you talk about really high performing teams is family. So they talk about each other as if they were family. The bond is as close as family. So what I'd like you just to do for me, just for a moment, if that's okay, is just to take a step. So we've done a bit of talking already. Now I'd like us just to take a little moment, close your eyes, take a breath, plant your feet on the floor, and I'm gonna ask you to just imagine for a moment the last time that you felt like family when you were in a team, that you had that sense of being in a family in the team that you were working in. And if you want to put anything in the comments afterwards about how that made you feel, or what, you're, what came to mind, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Right, Enrique, can you still hear me? Yes, if I take a couple yeah. of seconds to respond, it's because I have to click like 10 different things to, to, to unmute myself. <laughs> no, that's absolutely Just in case. fine. Awesome. Great. Okay, so Duane, can you put the slides back up again? You dropped out, hon. Maybe. Give it a go. If not, I can talk without them, but um, it'd be good if we could have them. Are they coming? I think uh, Duena may be frozen. Okay, all right. I'm going to carry on without the slides, if that's okay with everybody. Um, whenever you get a sec, Duena, and you're not, yeah, there we go. They're coming back. Here we go. So this is where I was about to go next. So having taken that moment just to think about what it might feel like if you were in a team and it felt like family, we wanted to just continue talking about what psychological safety is. So the title of this this workshop, this webinar is um, Psychological Safety, the Silicon Valley secret source for teams. So um, there's a couple of things that play into this. And one of them is, um, two, the, two, the two of them really are two really, really important sets of research. So I've already mentioned Amy Edmondson, who, you know, we've all got our celebrities, right? Um, in the world of psychological safety, she's, she's our hero, our celebrity. So, <coughs> excuse me, she spent about, 30 years now um, researching psychological safety specifically. And when you watch the TED Talks, you'll realize that you'll know that she stumbled across it accidentally um, whilst working in a healthcare setting. And she's worked across all sorts of settings looking at psychological safety, speaking up, a uh, speak up culture and teams ever since. So um, a lot of the work that we do is based around the work that she has done. Um, and she you know, has indicated that she's a, you know, a fan of what we're doing as well, which is good news. Um, the other piece here is that Google did the kind of definitive data set around psychological safety. So they started off doing a project around leadership and then they realized that they weren't getting to the nub of what really created the high performing teams. So they started looking at teams themselves and they looked for um, across a huge data set, you can see there four years, 50,000 people, 180 teams, 100 plus variables. And across all the data that they found, that they pulled out, that they discovered, they found that the most important lever of high performance was psychological safety. So this idea that a team can speak up, be vulnerable and take risks without fear of being ridiculed, not being listened to, or being ignored, the two slightly different things, 
is really, really important. So um, I think we really wanted to just give you a bit of the background there. And this, you know, this data set by Google, you know, there's a huge amount of research out there to be read and watched and videos, and it's well worth getting into if you're interested in psychological safety. So, Dwayne, right. over to you for a bit more about the secret sauce. Well, I try, but if I completely drop off, uh, you, you already know the story. So many apologies, guys. I, again, I don't know what's happening to our Wi-Fi. I hope it's not the beginning of the apocalypse or such. We are, after all, in London. Anything could be the matter today, sadly. Um, so finally, to the point of, that we're attempting to make. So once this has been studied enough by academics and then, obviously, by our hero, as, um, as Fionn called Professor Dr. Amy Edmondson, um, it became interesting enough that other bodies started kind of to, to take note. So obviously, if Google is saying the one thing that makes us magical is psychological safety, then other companies, um, in particular those that are just across the state from them and they envy their success, started to take notice. So a lot of, um, a lot of the bigger names that you can think of in Silicon Valley started to try to figure out what is it that, um, that Google has seen in psychological safety as a lever for highly productive teams? And once they, they have looked at it, one of the, the questions that has been raised was, is this um, particular to Google? Is this a, a situation that you can only see in an environment where the employees have been vetted in a certain fashion, in an environment where their work conditions are a lot better than elsewhere? Is this a Google thing? Is this replicable in um, any other instance or not? And in fact, the report that you're looking at, um, which is called the State of DevOps 2019, um, and it's done by a number of organizations, amongst which um, Google as well, has been able to replicate precisely that and show that in all elite high performance, um, they saw a common ground of a culture of psychological safety that was being upheld and was being transformed then in productivity directly in terms of, obviously these are companies that are um, mainly making software, but they are the same type of results that had been noticed in other industries by um, Dr. Edmondson and other researchers. But from the point of view of Silicon Valley, and we'll come back to this number, um, the, the point uh, that has finally permeated all industries is that if you want to become productive, if you want to make the type of products that um, would, would, would be sustainable and transform you into an elite um, performer, then you should start with a culture of psychological safety. So with that said, um, there are a number of other resources that you guys can go out there and get. This is for free. Please download it. I call it the first time that HR has to look into a, a tech report because it means um, the bridge between productivity and people. And also there's, an, um, there's a lovely book called Project... Um, you, you can actually read Project Phoenix and Project Unicorn, both of them are about DevOps at first glance, but they are about organizational culture, in fact. Um, and they, um, at least Project Unicorn is now showing in detail what the role of psychological safety is. So it's become mainstream from the point of view of companies that are uh, spending a lot of time on that. And you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. What if I ask? Okay. I think so, right? You can hear me, Fionn, right? I can hear you, absolutely. That just, just makes the two of us. <laughs> yeah. So, um, me, me too. Me too, okay. I can hear you too. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So going into um, in depth as to what it means, right? What, what, what does it mean to have a culture of psychological safety? Well, the number one thing that it means is um, relating to this set of behaviors that are collectively called impression management which are essentially the effort put in by a certain person in a team environment um, to avoid looking ignorant, to avoid looking intrusive or like they try, to avoid looking incompetent, like they don't know anything, and to avoid looking negative because they perceive that as being a problem. So whenever a team member, whether it's a team manager or it's a team member um, is engaging in a behavior where they fear appearing any of these things then their ability of being open of speaking up of being vulnerable and creative um, drops 
immediately, which is one of the reasons why we, we regard this set of behaviors as maybe the most dangerous and nocive thing that can happen to psychological safety. And we have spent a lot of time, for instance, in our software, trying to find ways to um, throw alerts towards the team leader to let them know that one of their team members um, is starting to engage into fearful behavior where they are managing negative, perceived possible negative impressions. Because whenever that happens, as we said, um, we immediately are unable to have the psychological safety we need to create together. That's one of the big sets of behaviors, is the negative one. Um, the other big topic um, that we should probably discuss, I'll let Fionn talk about it um, for a second, is the idea of speaking up, which we have um, touched on earlier. It's in the definition in itself. And it's essentially the ability of opening up and having um, your opinion voiced in a team environment. But yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to, to, so with talking about impression management and speaking up, what we wanted to give you a, a picture of was two of the most kind of fundamental behaviors to psychological safety. And one of the most fascinating things that I heard Amy Edmondson say in, one, in her book, The Fearless Organization, about impression management, just talking about the last slide, was what is really um, useful about thinking about psychological safety and working on psychological safety is that you can mitigate for what you see and what you hear but you cannot mitigate for what you don't see and you don't hear so if somebody's impression managing which means they are not speaking up or they're not showing their true fear of their true fear or concerns or worries or they're not telling you about an error that's occurred or might occur you, you can't do anything about that. So by working really hard, bringing us onto speaking up to create an environment in which people are able to be open and honest and bring their best ideas and their deepest fears, you know, you, are, you really are starting to move your team towards a high performing environment because you're starting to fill those gaps that you didn't even know were there. And you're starting to fill gaps for human beings as well and making them feel much more fulfilled, um, and willing to contribute and wanting to contribute. And that really makes people happy in the workplace, which is, you know, sounds like a nice to have, but it's not. When you're looking for high performance, that is um, in one of the qualities that you're looking for in a team. So when we're talking about speaking up, it's all of those things that I've just said. Um, so it, it cre creating a team environment where everybody says, speaks without fear, essentially. Right. So essentially what we were doing, what we spent a lot of time um, researching was the relationship between these behaviors and ways to, um, to affect change in them. Because it's all nice and good for all of us to relate to times when we were afraid to speak up for fear of appearing any of those things. Um, but that doesn't automatically mean that we can either stop that behavior or that the team has the psychological safety necessary to encourage a different set of behaviors. So we, the, our very first point of call has been, how do we slice and dice the health and well-being of a team into the elements that are going to foster a culture of speaking up? I, I'm sorry, I did interrupt you, Fionn, if you'd like to go ahead. No, 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 we needed to keep this, was, that's the flow, it's all good, yeah. So in terms of these elements that you're seeing on, on the screen, what we are testing for and we have what we have researched and come up with is essentially um, the, the difference, the subtle difference between these way of, of manifesting and in way, ways in which people are, are coming towards the team with um, an overall group behavior that gives them these components. So if you look at them, some of them appear to be um, quite close together. Um, Fion and I had did a number of videos to kind of try and demystify the difference between these, these uh, potential topics, but we don't expect anyone to have actually seen those. But essentially, the, the ones that seem um, seemingly to be very close together, things like courage and openness, or things like flexibility and resilience, they are actually really, really different. And 
if you then superimpose on top of that that it is desirable and necessary for a team to have good morale or a, a good degree of engagement and that they are able to learn and innovate together almost as a result, then you already have um, a, a more complete picture of what are the bits and pieces that you should keep an eye on. And the, the point of today's conversation, we're, we're going to be very open and honest. If you find a tool that helps you keep an eye on these things, use that. If you don't, still keep an eye on these things. Still make sure that you are um, holding these components as top of mind and you're spending time trying to make sure the team is flexible and therefore resilient, trying to make sure that they're courageous, but also that they're open, which are two different things, and, and absolutely making sure that they are engaged and learning together as a result. So those are the components we have come up with for now. And speaking of components and keeping an eye on it, it's very difficult to keep an eye on things without having the um, lens for it, right? So whether it's, it shouldn't be a child's job that um, overall that they, they take time trying to understand each and every thing. This should be a much more um, team focused exercise. That's the case for anyone who has any type of direct report. And for them to be able to look at those components and for all of us to be able to look at our team and analyze it from those points of view, then we have to be empowered with enough EQ to do so, right? So a lot of team members, a lot of uh, team leaders are actually in, have never had any kind of, of exposure to the idea of EQ. They weren't even necessarily allowed or aware that they should be even discussing these topics at work. So what we do with, with some of the teams we work with is go right back to basics, um, talk about emotions, what are those, how can they recognize them, um, how can they focus on them in their team, and provide team leaders really with the, with the permission to start thinking under those terms and the indication that they need to do so so that they can keep an eye on the health of their team. One of the things that we have also spent a lot of time on doing is um, once we have brought team leaders at a certain level of emotional intelligence, we then start giving them an indication on what they're doing well on these topics by looking at uh, an overall leadership score, if you wish, and giving them um, also a measurement of how empathic they are, that being the main um, ability or disability to recognize these things. And then um, we're even measuring positivity because their, um, their ability of inspiring their team is really, really important. Also on the topic of um, EQ, what we do, what we're working on, and what we need your help with even, because it's, it's a really big topic, is um, we're focused on producing something called an, emotional, an EQ trainer which is essentially a feature that's going to allow team leaders to become better and better at recognizing the emotions of their team members. Um, and we have that side by side with this other thing um, that you see on the screen called Coach Me, which is essentially bringing the knowledge and the wisdom of other human beings into the software um, with an ability for team leaders to access that immediately. So did I interrupt you, Fionn? No, no, not at all. No, I was, I was thinking as you were speaking about how <clears throat> the number of conversations I've had in the last couple of weeks um, about emotional intelligence in teams. And, you know, it's something that we always work on. Um, and that is really critical to a successful team. But no, team leaders and people in teams um, and people in very senior roles looking at teams of teams are all saying, now we're in this remote environment. I understand that emotional intelligence is crazy important for my team. It just got even more important. How do I build that in the digital environment? How do I continue to maintain that? How do I bring people back from where they, because some people have kind of um, hit the reset button and some behaviors and um, I've gone a bit ski whiff, maybe a little bit out of the window as a result of the, you know, the stressful environment some of us are under at the moment. Um, so this couldn't be a more important topic at the moment. And we just, it's, you know, it's always been hugely important, um, but I don't think it could be any more important than right now to focus on being able to be aware of each other's emotions and how we're feeling. 
And we, we recognize, without a doubt, in particular with, with the um, efforts that we've, we've put into this over the last few weeks, and we'll tell you a little bit more about what we're trying to do, is um, we have seen people come to us and say, well, what are my chances to be overnight developing an ability to, um, to have a robust EQ that's going to help my team? Because we have to remember, we have solely looked at the ability to perform from the point of view of an intellectual um, side of things and from the point of view of um, skills with very different definitions than those of recognizing emotion. So there are vast legions of team leaders out there from CEOs to um, uh, someone with two reports who are completely, they think themselves completely unable to um, understand and, and, and process their own emotions and the emotions of their teams. So their questions are rightfully, even if the organization um, now all of a sudden tells me that they desire this behavior out of me, that they are able to uh, potentially um, reward me for doing the right thing from this perspective, even if I buy that, how can I make sure that I become um, overnight like a pop psychologist? or I like to use this comparison, which I know that Fiona is not hor horribly on board with, is how do I turn myself into a counselor Troy, for those of us who have seen, um, is it Star Trek, Voyager or such? Um, and so the ability of, of, of uh, transforming into someone who gets emotional intelligence and, and, and has the ability to access it at will in, enough to uh, understand their team, is um, in question. Many people don't feel ready for it, but it's surprising how fast uh, team leaders understand, learn, and, and start applying these principles once they, they, they comprehend them. Yeah. Right, so in terms of practical advice, right, what we were, what we were hoping to kind of discuss with you today is um, we, we, we spent a good hour today hunting for one video, which I believe some of you may have seen, um, a video um, from Brené Brown that was um, talk, talking about the myths of HR. I wonder if some of you have seen that. I can't find it online anymore. But what it is essentially is um, among those myths, one of the key ones is we believe our people don't want to tell us anything. But at the same time, we never ask them anything. Or if we do, we ask them something long and horrible once a year. Um, I wish she told you that because she uh, expresses it obviously a lot more Ted-like than we can. But the point um, she's making there is we need to be inquisitive. We need to get over this collective um, impression management fear of not uh, prying and, and ask and ask incessantly and open that dialogue um, channel with our people, whether it's through a tool like ours or you find other ways to do it that's um that's fine we don't not either way just find the the channel where people feel like they your people in your team not your organization in total but your actual team um they feel like they have a channel to to engage with you in a meaningful way and in um in a constant way and that's very important from the point of view of the channel as well absolutely and the um just going back there for a moment, one of the, if you watch, um, if you read some of the research, um, and I know somebody's posted a link to some of that Google research on the chat feed, so thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Alison, and thank you very much indeed. When you read that, and if you look at some of the key takeaways, um, Google give you a couple of really good tips. They give you all the tips in the world, but particularly about two things that you can do in, with your people and in your team meetings. And one of them is what they call conversational turn taking. Um, and so that, that is literally making sure everybody in the room has a voice. And online, what does that look like? Um, not everybody's going to want to be on video. I'm a huge advocate of video, as Dwayne knows, and I, you know, but I absolutely recognize that we're in a different environment to the one we were in two months ago when I was trying to get people onto video. Now we need to be mindful of everybody's needs, but how can we give people a voice, get them to use the chat boxes, get them to use the different functionalities, pick up the phone and talk to them, but make sure everybody's got a voice. Um, and if you're in a meeting, make sure everyone speaks for roughly the same amount of time. Um, and the other one is something called ostentatious listening, which is active listening. Um, and that is ensuring that in a group setting, in your team setting, that you have a culture where people listen to each other intently. 
and don't interrupt, don't talk over, let someone finish, listen and respond to what they've said. So active listening in a group setting. So those are a couple of things you can do with that ask and care topic straight away with your teams. I think we just gave a horrible example of it because I was interrupting you just as uh, you were explaining the importance. <laughs> of it. We're all human, eh? <laughs> but you, you guys get it, don't do that. Um, and also, there is a video coming um, up tomorrow of Fiona and I talking about this kind of meeting fatigue and, and video because we think it's a, it's a very timely topic that we have to allow for from, from a human perspective. So look out for that in our newsletter tomorrow. But uh, going back to things that you can do, um, and I'm, I'm hugely passionate about this next one, which is obsess about the team. I personally find that we have lost our way in, in focusing on the topic of team. I keep saying this over and over like a broken record. I think we have spent a ridiculous amount of time talking about the organization, which uh, to me is just as real as Santa. Uh, there is no such thing as the organization. It's not a living organism. Um, and we have spent some time, but not quite as, 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 as much as we should, talking about the individual. And which is great, and we should do a lot more of that. But we have spent very, very little talking about the team in, in that um, kind of 80s fashion that has then gone out of, um, gone out of the trend. But um, going back to the, to the most useful unit in, in, an, in an enterprise, which is the team, is probably what's going to allow us to make changes a lot faster, to accept changes a lot faster, and to adapt to this new reality. So um, whatever you do, if you are a team leader and you, you use a tool, brilliant. If you don't use a tool, please have a mental image like this one that tells you at all times who all is in my team, who are the people that I, the lives of whom I'm responsible for, essentially, the, 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 who are the people that I have to care about in terms of their emotions, in terms of their group well-being, in terms of their psychological safety, and then keep an eye on these bits and pieces that all together will um, give them the psychological safety advantage that we were talking about earlier. So just keep being obsessed about the team unit. Figure out which one is your team and you might find yourself being part of multiple teams. You might be part of a management team. You might be a team leader for your, um, for your respective team. You might be part of a cross-departmental team. You have all of these um, new ways of organizing teams, which are these chapters, the SWOT teams, you name it. It doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter how many people in it. It doesn't matter what it's there for. As long as you have a common purpose and enough goodwill to attempt to deliver on it, then you have a team um, and one that you should spend time on. Now, obviously everyone here, this is a, a bit of a, um, we realize it's going to be a little bit of a controversial slide. Everyone here cares about humans and has humans as their day job already, right? We, we know that. I would say, I would go further and say, we don't until such a time that we obsess about how they feel instead of spending time on process and regulation. I know that's slightly controversial. I know we talked earlier today about how important it is to get all of these processes in order. I don't disagree that it is important to spend time on that, but is it more important than focusing on the emotions of your team? No, it, it really is not. And um, I don't know exactly how we're doing on time because of all of these kind of in and outs that we've managed. I do apologize. So let's just a couple just of minutes. Kind of, Sorry. Uh, not a lot. Yes, I, I, I thought so. So let's try and, and, and speed this up and say that um, I'll, I'll let Fionn explain this to you because she's a lot more uh, elegant in how she puts it. But essentially, we have come up with, um, with a response to this crisis, with an, an, an offering for those of you that are trying to make this slightly more automated and easier. Talk to us about it. I mean, that's, uh, it, it comprises of various things, all of which are free and are there for you to, to grab. But one of the main things that it, um, it comprises of is what we call the Stay Connected Pack. And if you are using ours, brilliant, we can help you get set up immediately. If you're not and you're attempting to replicate this, do it. Do um, a version of it yourself. You can start kind of writing questions tonight. I don't know exactly what method you can use to deliver them and to kind of collect the type of response you'd like to, but start spending time on um, the, the line of dialogue that would 
signal to your people that you get it. You understand where they're at. You see them, you hear them, you go through the same things. So one of the most important things we can do with, with our teams right now as team leaders is to ensure that we have this commonality of experience, that we all go through the same things. And as long as you ask the right questions, they know that you are um, experiencing the same type of upheaval, that it's difficult for everyone, that it's scary, that it's um, frightening, but it's also um, a means for all of us to, to start putting our collective heads together into how we can make it more solid, how we can make it more positive, how we can learn things together. But the number one thing to do, I would say, um, that you can start doing yourself tonight, today, um, is to ask them these type of questions. Did you want to say something, Fiona? In terms of the Stay Connected Pack or the offering, or I think. Um, right, I mean, wh whatever. I, I'm not sure exactly how much time we have. So we'll just kind of try and whiz through this and see if we have any questions from anyone. Because I'd love to. My problem is I can't see the actual chat on, on LinkedIn Live. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> I'm dying, not knowing what people are saying. It's very blind. I'm looking at it. It's okay. Um, oh. Yeah. So essentially, you know, the, the final thing to say is that this, we, we're in very, very unusual times. Psychological safety has always been important. It's always been super important in digital teams. The only difference now is that we're all in digital teams and likelihood is we're going to be in more digital teams into the future than we thought we would be, which, you know, is um, considered by myself to be potentially a very, very good thing, but obviously we would much rather this crisis wasn't occurring. However, as people who are passionate about software and the role that it has in driving teams, we couldn't just sit on, um, on what we're doing and not offer it out to the world. So what you see in front of you is, is the offering that we're making to people at the moment. It's a free package of um, specifically designed um, works, the software, the Stay Connected Questions Pack that you just had an insight into, and then the free online uh, emotional intelligence crash course for team leaders. It comes as a package. If you feel that you need that, your teams need that at the moment, your people need support, please come to us. That's all we're saying. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a long time before this crisis occurred. Um, and you'll see a lot of software companies offering similar at the moment because we know that now is the time for software to be able to really support teams. So um, that's really everything we wanted to say. Um,